Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. everybody to Night Light. So glad you could join us. We're really, I'm really excited about today's show, but, but first I want to thank Ken Quiethawk for his amazing, amazing intro. Please look for him on the internet. Look under Native Storytellers. He and his wife are uh, the last of a hopefully not dying breed. Uh, they are Native Storytellers and they show how pres- per, I love them. they show how preserving your history and your cosmology through stories It's a far better way of providing history to those who are coming up in the younger generations. Um, Absolutely a better way of learning where you come from and where you're going than looking at textbooks. And these are stories that will remain in your memory forever and you'll retell and therefore you preserve history so so that we all become living history books if we tell our history through stories. So check them out. Today I have two amazing people on with me. I'm very excited to have Dr. Robert Haramas and Laura Kortner on with me. They've uh, co-authored actually many books, but we're going to be talking about one in particular. And it's one that that most of my generation um, can relate to absolutely. This book details the merry and wildly creative tribe who produced the Beatles' Yellow Submarine, that groundbreaking, one-of-a-kind visual adventure first released in 1968. We get to know the formerly undiscovered artists and technical wizardry behind some of the favorite scenes and discover some of the symbolic interpretations and subconscious messages of peace and love that have been inspired by this movie. In addition, we get in studio hijinks by the frustrated animators. This book lifts the veil of the animation screen to see behind the Beatles and detail that one magical year during the summer of love in swinging London when a band of young artist fans fell into the groove and brought their heroes into animated life. Dr. Bob has been on a mission since 1968 to discover the hidden reality behind the Beatles' Yellow Submarine. In 1969, he founded AUM, the first state-approved school of esoteric studies in the country. He's been interviewed frequently on the History Channel, Discovery, National Geographic, BBC, and you just name it, it goes on forever, and Nightlight is on there too. His radio interview program, 21st Century Radio, Exploring Consciousness and Alternative Realities, has been on the air since 1988. It's the longest running of its kind. Laura Kortner has collaborated with Dr. Bob on several books. She's also a writing partner and editor for Dr. Zahara Hieronymus and 21st Century Radio, where she serves as executive producer. In addition to Inside the Yellow Submarine, she and Dr. Bob co-authored Founding Fathers, Secret Societies, United, United Symbolism of America, and most recently Secret Life of Lady Liberty, Goddess in the New World. Obviously, this is an old bio. Uh, that's a historical and symbolic analysis of the Statue of Liberty from feminist and Native American perspectives. Both of these people have 
poured a lot of their energy, their insight, their wisdom, and their insight into the two volumes of the Yellow Submarine to explore the creative genius that came out of it, though unintentional. So I want to welcome both of you to the show. It's such an honor to have both of you here. Thank you so much for having us. This yeah. is really going to be exciting talking to you about this book. And it's a big honor and to be so, here. Ah, <laughs> well, thank oh, you, thank is. you. Um, <clears throat> well, Nightlight, Nightlight Radio is tended to, I mean, the, the title, the, 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 the name of the show, Nightlight, is it was intentional. It's, it's meant to, to bring a little bit of light into the darkness, and, and certainly the Yellow Submarine did that in spades. And um, so, I mean, I, I had not actually seen the video until I read your book, and then I went and I bought the video, and then I've watched the video, and I've read the book. And I think what, what impresses me the most is, first of all, I mean, it took you, what, 50 years to gather all this information together? <laughs> yes, it did. That's half a century. <clears throat> it seemed a little bit longer than that because I'd never thought I was going to get there from the standpoint of, you know, when you ask the Beatles, I don't know how many times, a hundred times or so that, that I wrote to them and asked them about where did this come from, how did it evolve, we, I just couldn't get any anywhere. And fortunately, by working with uh, Laura, of course, because Laura, a lot of people, <clears throat> you know, when they when they work with other people, uh, seem to think that the oldest one is the, is the guy that's the leader. That's not the case in this situation because Laura knew what I was trying to do, but I did not have the ability to put it into words that are understandable, which she is quite excellent at, which makes this a much easier book for me to try to understand over a period of time. To even understand your own work, huh? That's right. <laughs> based, well. on, based on Bob's <clears throat> old research, certainly, as he said. But I, I'm glad you started, Barbara, by saying that you watched the movie again, because I like to tell people when they're listening to us being interviewed, if you haven't seen the movie before or if you haven't seen it lately, then go watch it again. You'll, you'll want to by the time you hear more of us talking or just put it on pause. That's the great thing about the Internet, and come listen to the interview again. It's streaming now on iTunes. And it's, it's the Beatles. You know, you mentioned your generation, but your, your opening to your show had some things that, that grabbed me. You know, it's a beacon to guide us to a better way and, and weave our lights together. That reminds me of the Beatles themselves. They're, they're in our DNA in a way, you know, even if you're not a fan or an enthusiast, and there are plenty of those out there who are still – very much every day all about the Beatles. We, we have interacted with them a lot in promoting this uh, book. Um, you know, if you have more modern taste in music, there's still there's that message, that fundamental peace and love that we can aspire to. And because it's such good music and their harmonies are so good, we end up singing together and dancing together. So it entrains your brain and it, it, it helps lift us all up to, as you say, it's a beacon to guide us to a better way. And, and we're weaving it together with these beautiful harmonies. And then you add the yellow submarine. You've added the visual element of this enormously colorful film full of pop and wonderfully designed visual puns. So it appeals to all generations. A lot of Beatle fans become Beatle fans at a very young age these days by watching the film. You read that over and over again, I think. George Harrison even mentioned it on the Beatles anthology, that that's how a lot of people, in fact, their children, I think John Lennon's and George Harrison's children both, learned that their parents were Beatles by watching Yellow Submarine or hearing other people talk about the film. So that's one of the reasons we are so fascinated with this 50-year-old cartoon. But Bob originally was inspired by his very strong sense of injustice. Whenever he sees somebody not getting credit for something that they deserve credit for, in this case, about 200 different artists who were going unnamed for a, a good 10, 20 years. Nobody knew anything about anybody who made the film, and that's why he set out in the beginning of the early 70s. It wasn't until the 1990s that he actually tracked down people who made the film um, because the concept out there was, was allowed to be misunderstood that this is a Beatles film, where, in fact, those four gentlemen had 
almost nothing to do with the making of the film, other than their songs being, the, you know, the driving mm -hmm. force of the reason for the film and, and the plot of the film. And, and that's what makes the film so good, is it's full of Beatles music. But it makes oh, it feel good, right? It's a feel-good movie, <clears throat> and it, it, it's all about peace and love. So it's worth watching again and again. Well, when you when you when you, when you iTunes, read, I should say, and and it's worth it's worth watching. It's I went I bought it. Um, I I thought you know I'm going to have to go over this a couple of times. So let me just have it here so I can do it when you know ever I feel like it. But I think the one point that comes up over and over and over again is it's their message in their music, not necessarily. It's a message that came through their music. They. What what in, impressed me the most, first of all, with the music is that they had no intention of, you know, putting symbology into any of it. They had no intent on, you know, having a subtle message channeled through and stuff like that. No intention at all. They just let it flow. And they, they had no um, intention of being spiritual teachers, and yet they did become that. And with the artists, they weren't given any real direction to, you know, put this in here or use this color or use that color and yet the colors all hit you in uh, in the chakra system they hit you in levels of awareness they give a message to you I, I love the fact that the bad guys are, are blue meanies they 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 don't make them demonic they don't you know they're, they're just mean and it, it's kind of it, cute it's really yeah and and it's important for us to realize that sometimes people who are mean just don't understand yeah, and yeah. I mean and the the, me the the messages there are just amazing. Yeah, and, and like you said, um, the greater works of art are are almost to a, a, a each of them are are coming from another plane of existence, and you hear this a lot from great artists and musicians, and I think you've talked about it on your show with other musicians and whatnot. When even Yellow Submarine, Paul McCartney, who wrote that song tells that it came to him in a dream. It came from somewhere uh -huh. else, from his higher consciousness or from another plane of existence, who's to know? But um, the Beatles themselves were also, when they got asked this a lot, you know, the meaning of your song, the meaning of your song, um, they just wrote what came into their heads. They insist that, 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 you know, it was all coincidental if there's any deeper meaning. But then as they thought about it, you know, it's like abstract art, John Lennon was quoted as saying. It's, if you think about it too much, it just means you, you're working on it. Um, you know, but there are other songs I didn't have any intention for. I just threw the words down, I threw the music down, and then people will see a deeper meaning in it because they want to. You know, but they won't mm -hmm. believe me when I try to tell them it wasn't meant to be important. And as you say, <laughs> the co-creators of the film were the same way. They had such limited time and very little direction that it was pretty much made up as they went along. Yes, there, well, and there really was no plot. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> there really was no plot in this movie. It took quite a while for them to develop it. Uh, and and uh, especially when that plot came along and when, when we finally got to the point of how it came about, it came about through, well, Pogo came about... <laughs> And Rocky and, and Rocky and Bullwinkle. That's how uh -huh. it really opened, because I had no, there was no way to find out who did what. And that's what disturbed me the, the greatest, because that, I knew that hundreds of people were being involved in this, but getting no credit at all. That's not, that's very unbeatle like them. And, it did, and I'm glad that they finally overcame that idea of, of just taking credit for it and allowing those people who put it together to speak their piece on it, which is what our books are, are basically all about. The first book, of course, is, is more or less about, uh, well, kind of uh, more of about intelligence and the mind and that kind of thing. But the second book is about discovering the people who created it, which is a family. This movie spawned a family a family of what I consider to be the future. I'm an artist myself, and I know how difficult it is to exist as an artist. And when you hear their stories as to how some of them did eat and didn't eat uh, and how they were able to accomplish this uh, with some dignity without uh, making themselves look like 
some big stars or something because they didn't look at themselves that way. They were there to do the Beatles' work, and they were proud to do it, and they accomplished that, whether or not the Beatles even knew that they did it. Let me just tie it back to Rocky and Bullwinkle to put a bow in that one that he brought up. is um, When he discovered, uh, he was doing some interviews on the Rocky and Bullwinkle show and interviewing a voice actress who does Rocky the Squirrel, June Foray, and they started talking about Bob's frustration at not being able to figure out who designed what. And she said, well, I happen to know the director of the film, Bob Balser. He is one of the co-directors of animation, and he sits with me on the Academy Award for Animated Film Committee. And they hooked up together from that. And Bob's first interview with Bob Balser, he was so disappointed to find out that the animators and artists had not put any intentional symbolical meaning in, in the <laughs> film. He thought for sure that there was an intentional cosmic meaning that he had interpreted for then about 15 years or so on his own. He even taught a college course on the interpretation of the yellow submarine. It's just full of so much wonderful symbology that he thought it had to have been on purpose. And Bob Balser said, no, nope, sorry, but you know what? The more I think about it, the more I hear you talk, and the more I hear your theories, I think that there's a lot of room for that. And that's also back to the Beatles, what, what they did in their later lives. They, they may have said that um, there's a quote by John Lennon in there, one of his last interviews. You know, we we weren't doing that much different from everybody else. The whole movement was happening. We we might have been at the top of the masthead singing Land Ho or something, you know, as a, a leader, but, um, you know, everybody was moving in that same direction. And Yoko Ono said she took it a little further than I think they would have. She said that they were like mediums. They weren't conscious of all they were saying, but it was coming through them. So. The animators, to a person, insisted they didn't do anything on purpose, except for Eric Siegel, the writer, who happened to be a professor of classics at Yale. He did consciously think about the the um, classical hero's journey, for example, the Joseph Campbell um, uh -huh. format, which we can go through later if you want, um, to make a plot. Uh, a lot of his script and plot wasn't used in the end, but he was brought in Towards the um, end of the script writing kerfuffle, there were so many scripts they didn't know what to do. Uh, and he gave it a structure, which was the standard structure that you'll see in any classic film or book. Like It's the reason we keep watching them over and over again, because they give meaning to our lives in this classic pattern. It, it resonates in our, in our soul, so to speak. Um, things like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or Wizard of Oz, they all follow this sort of hero's journey pattern of the, the young person who is given a challenge and then he leaves his home or her home and goes off on a series of adventures. And there's a set pattern that the mythologist Joseph Campbell set down, and, and we actually go through that whole thing and, and say how the Yellow Submarine fits that. But um, they didn't do that on purpose necessarily. They, they were in such a hurry. They were given so little time. 11 months, as opposed to a Disney film of this nature, a feature film, the only other company doing feature films and animation, would have taken them four years. So they had an enormous pressure. And as I said, they couldn't figure out what to do. You know, the script was, they kept getting, um, they were trying to do like the Beatles cartoon series, which preceded it, made by the same people, uh, which was done very quickly as a money-making extravaganza. They cranked out a cartoon every week. Uh, and that's what the American producers were hoping to do with the film. But the British producers and directors said, no, a feature film has to be higher quality. So they brought in a fancy graphic designer, Heinz Edelman, who'd never done animation before, and his designs were a bit flat and harder to animate. But it was worth the effort because he was so creative. He came up with all the ideas, all the characters, um, and eventually the sea of monsters and all the idea of the blue meanies. That all was Heinz Edelman's idea. It came out of his subconscious under enormous pressure. He didn't in, enjoy his time on Yellow Submarine. And that's detailed in Volume 1, as, as Bob was saying. The difference between Volume 1, which came out in 2002, is it's mostly the main people, like the writer, the artist, the designer, the directors, um, you know, about 30 of those who were creatively coming up with the ideas. And as soon as that book came out, we started to hear from some of the younger people that we'd missed, and uh, we thought they were going to tell us the same stories we'd already heard, but lo and behold, they started telling us new stories that were quite interesting, and we interviewed a lot of the younger set in Volume 2. And uh, that's what uh, this book is mostly about. It's um, the younger people who were doing, not the trace and paint necessarily, some of those, yes, but 
the um, what you call a key animator. So you have a, 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 a director. Normally you have a storyboard, but they didn't have time for that. So they came up with an idea from the director um, down, and he just told his, uh, his little crew there of four or five key animators what the next segment would be. They didn't know what the one following it would be. They didn't know what the one preceding it would be. They just got a, an idea, okay, this is what you need to animate. And those are the people we interviewed for volume two. So they were mostly in their 20s. Uh, the youngest was actually 17, um, some of them in their young 30s. But um, they, many of them, it was their first job, and they were huge Beatles fans. This was 1967, and everything was changing. London was the place to be. It was called Swinging London for a reason. You know, the, the miniskirts were just happening. And uh, so we, we have um, accounts of people coming. It was an international crew, people coming from Australia or South Africa and realizing they had to cut off a whole bunch of inches off of their skirts. And uh, just how it's the best year of their lives. They t over and over again, these younger, this younger crew, it, you know, they, it was a magical, they were aware that they were in the middle of a perfect storm, of everything just falling into place. It was the right people at the right time and the groovy music that they all loved. They wanted to do homage to their fans, their, their heroes, the Beatles. Well, it, it was amazing, and, and, you know, the more I look at, at, at it, the more I, I, I kept getting other things. And, and I think that if you saw this 20 years ago or, or how, yeah, 20 years ago or whatever, it, it, it's worth it to see it again because what you get out of it is determined by the level of consciousness you're perceiving it by. Yeah, and, good point. And, and what, what I found... The one, I mean, a lot of it kind of just stood out at me. And but there's one sequence in there about pushing the buttons, and if you push the button, there's a consequence. And mm. um, it it just it it was you know Ringo pushed the button and he got you know he he got dropped out of the, the submarine and and whatever. But but sometimes if you push a button, the consequences and the journey it takes you on may not be comfortable, but in the end you're going to be okay. That's right. And That's right. so, so it, 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 you know, it, there, there were, there were, I keep seeing, you know, you know, I have to tell you, I didn't, the first time I saw it, I thought, oh my God, this looks like Monty Python or, or um, a little bit of Picasso. And, you know, it, 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 well, it influenced it was, Monty Python. Terry Gilliam is very um, upfront about that. He, he learned a lot about his animation style by watching Yellow Submarine. Well, it shows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it's but the same it time was, period, you know, late 60s, same type of humor. Yeah, which I absolutely loved, and, of course, England. Um, but it, it just, you know, I kept seeing different messages that, that I certainly didn't see the first time I, I watched it, or maybe even the second time. But, but knowing I was looking for the messages that were there on a consciousness level, and and. I forget which one of them says it's all in the mind, it's all in the mind, it's all in the mind. Mm -hmm. You know, George. kind of like George, thank you. Um, just turning turning on my mind and saying, okay, there are messages here yep. that they didn't even mean to put in, so let me see if I can find some more. Yep. And they, they, it was, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, it was a wonderful journey. Yeah, it's all in the mind they used as a promotional tagline on the theater posters. And in the movie, George Harrison character says it twice. He changes the uh -huh. perception of the color of the car that he's driving when we first meet him. Um, it, it befuddles Ringo. It's a funny little joke um, because Ringo's relying too much on the physical reality as the ultimate truth. So it's all in the mind is a very Eastern concept of that human beings are more than material there's a mortal aspect to them, you know, the soul or the spirit. And you can use the mind to expand your consciousness. And from there, mm -hmm. you can travel to various dimensions. Um, you know, there's supervised, ritualized drug use can take you there too. But a very steady practice, consistent practice of meditation, prayer, and service can also take you to that level of mind. So it's all in the mind. He used it again uh, later on in the film when he's falling down off of the off of the top of uh -huh. the of the Sergeant Pepper, but it's um, yeah, it's it's very clear that that's what they were they were trying to connect that to the the uh, growing uh, Eastern mysticism in the in the population at the time. 
Well, the other the other place where it was so clear that there was something like that going on is when they when they went into that hallway and there was this the, the ha long hallway with all the doors. Oh yeah. yeah. And opening the different doors to different dimensions to different uh, lifetimes to different whatever. It was you know a, a lot of people who do past life stuff. Um, they're taken down a corridor and they're told to select a door and then they go into that particular lifetime because the doors all have in the, in, in past life regression, all the doors have dates on them. So, um, you know, I saw that corridor and it was like, whoa, I know what this is. <laughs> I used to so, study that corridor and all the things that were going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And um, I especially appreciated that. But then again, it was all that none of that happened when people were there. All of the things had happened were when people weren't there. Uh -huh. And so, therefore, there was something about the invisible, something about that which is not physical is more important than that which is physical from that standpoint. Right. They, they only pop out. Those creatures only pop out when no one's looking at them. And that brings up the question of what does the world look like when nobody's looking at it? It's the same thing as the car changing colors, which brings up the question with your own car. You know, if you've had an old car and you've replaced part after part after part, is it the same car, even though you've changed all the parts? So that brings up the whole question of what's real and what's imaginary. We select what we see. We, we invent our own reality. That's what that Hall of Mirrors really brings home to me. Um, uh -huh. The nothing is real is another tagline that they used on the posters. Nothing is real. We're living in a world of illusion. No thing it's is real. real. Matter, that oh. matter, the physical world. It's all an illusion. So the physical world is not all there is to reality. There's the inner life, the spiritual life. It's closer to oh, reality, yeah. in fact, than the physical material world, which is mm -hmm. always changing. Oh. And you can you can I, read that into the various scenes in the film. Yeah. I, and I think I think most people don't understand that they do create their reality by their their perception of it. So that right. so that you know what you have, if you aren't happy with it, perceive it in a different way, and it becomes a different way. So you know right. we have we have inner power that that you know I, I often have have described our physical avatar that wherein the spirit dwells is like a, a luxury car with all the bells and whistles, but we don't have the manual. So so we have to experiment. That's, that's great. That is great. <laughs> <laughs> we should have put that in the book. I, I mean, so, so, so basically, you know, you have to experiment and discover where the headlights are and the windshield wipers, the two most important, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, then go on and find out how to make the windows go up and down and, and all of that so that, you know, on your spiritual journey, it depends on where you're stopping in the in the owner's manual or creating the owner's manual, just exactly how far you go this lifetime. And and that means, of course, what's going to happen in the future is dependent upon what you did in the past. Yes. Which yeah, makes yeah. common, you know, it's very good sense to me. I mean, uh, I remember when I first heard this. Uh, uh, I used to laugh at this kind of stuff. I really did. I didn't have any idea that there was a higher consciousness from that standpoint. Um, I was a Bertrand Russellite. Do you remember Bertrand Russell? I do. I think uh, I'm your was, age, actually. <laughs> you know, he, is, he, is, he was a god of mine. Uh, uh, and fortunately, I had a, a teacher in, uh, in high school that told me early on that he... He uh, thought that I should get involved with things that were Greek and those things that were in, in, along these particular lines. And fortunately, I did by, he, I said, well, what about trying to reach Bertrand Russell? And he says, I'll give you his phone number. I'll give you his address. You know, he's going to want to talk to you because you're talking the way he talks. Uh, uh -huh. But I didn't know that. So, of course, I wrote to him, and darn if he didn't answer me three times. Uh -huh. Uh, wow. uh, and and it, it's more or less, of course, he, he was also saying, hey, there's a lot of other homework you got to do before you start doing, uh, moving in the, in, the, in the realm that you think you're working in. So uh, I had to learn how to research all over again from that standpoint. But it was well, quite an important journey. 
but but isn't that what life is all about? And and it's not the important thing is not arriving somewhere. It's the journey. That's the teaching tool. Correct. That's right. And uh, so, but I want to get back to one of the other cool things. This yellow submarine traveled more in the ether than it did in the water. And you know, <laughs> you notice that, huh? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. but if you want to get into really conspiracy stuff. Theoretically, according to conspiracy theorists and, and you know, whom I love, um, the first spaceships in this secret space program were atomic submarines. Hey, that's hmm. per- yes, indeed. That's, uh, that's a lot of, there's a lot of new stuff coming out of, especially in regards to, to Antarctica and uh, uh-huh. what has been going on down there for for. Millennia, not excuse me, not millennia, but Who for knows? hundreds of years. Probably, for hundreds of probably years. millennia. Uh, well, and uh, a lot of a lot of people are that are into the UFOs are not discussing this particular area um, because they don't they don't want to they don't want to feel like uh, uh, that they're breaking some rules or regulations because it, something really terrible has been going on down there. For quite a Absolutely. long time, and it's going to continue to do so. Um, and I don't know how it's going to be prevented because, it, uh, again, most Americans don't know that this is going on. Isn't that correct? Oh, absolutely. I mean, most you know, they, they, as you say. I, and, yeah, and, I saw you. Have, you know, I saw one when I was in college. So I'm definitely a believer. But you, you look at Operation High Jump. You know, if the government sent all those ships and everything to the Antarctic had to be a reason, and they came back awful fast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, right. um, so no, but but I want to get back to the yellow submarine because this is such right. a cool it, thing. It, to, it doesn't fly through water very much. It's mostly in some identified ether space, as we call it, or, or in the air sometimes. But even the char- it's even in the script, Ringo, when he first... Uh, when he first encounters the yellow submarine, it's flying behind him, following him along in Liverpool. And he says, uh-huh. I'm, I think I must have seen an unidentified flying cupcake, as he says, because it's <laughs> funny. Uh, and then he immediately, his rational brain kicks in and says, no, must have been a figment of my imagination. But that, of course, allows us to talk about the object, the, the, the whole concept of UFOs and USOs, the lesser-known underwater unidentified uh-huh. submarine objects, um, mm-hmm. at least 50% of sightings have occurred over a body of water with either the e, the UFO flying into or out of the water. And that's led some people like Ivan T. Sanderson to theorize that perhaps they have bases underwater, that they've been living in what you might call a hydrosphere, which, of course, is what is Pepperland in the movie. The, the location of the in the film itself is Pepperland is described at the very beginning as lying 80,000 leagues underneath the sea. So the yellow submarine is traveling between the real and the unreal, between air and water both, just like a UFO. So UFOs are everywhere now. It's um, Something is going on with the disclosure in the United States that is is odd and, <laughs> and, and strange that we're here, hearing about it on the major media with such frequency. So just from the United States, I'll add, you know, there's other countries too who have secret files and nobody else is talking about it. So something is happening with with a, a planned release, I hope, or some kind, uh, that is just leaking out a little at a time. It's, it's, um, it's a strange shift, though. All of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, of course, yes, now that we have Navy well, sightings, as if we haven't had Navy pilot sightings all along, but now we have Navy pilot sightings, there's something absolutely unidentified. Yeah. Well, I think back in the 40s, they didn't think the public could handle it, and now the public is handling it better than the government is. With a bit of a yawn. I find that remarkable. It's just a yawn, yeah. UFOs are out there, yeah. So what? what a great insight that is. That's, that's exactly. <laughs> and, and then when you get into the symbolism of it, because yellow is a symbol of the intelligence uh, or uh-huh. the mind and the supremacy over the lower nature or higher consciousness or uh, the physical or emotional aspects of humans, yellow can therefore be a symbol for divine wisdom, the divine mind, the celestial truth. Yellow is often a substitute for gold, giving it the additional connotations of love and 
constancy and dignity. Yellow is also the color of the sun, the giver of life to the earth. And uh, to the ancients, the sun was the universal symbol for higher self, or God, or the creator made manifest. So submarine, then when you get into submarine, the sub means it's under or hidden. And marine means water. Water is often used to symbolize the unconscious mind or that mm -hmm. which is below normal consciousness or awareness. Water is a powerful, adaptable symbol, and it can also be symbolic of the fluid, boundless sea of space. When you, because as, would you like to carry that further there, Lars? Well, you put the two together. You've got yellow which is expansive and mental and divine mind, and you've got submarine, which is below and unconscious and the emotions, and you combine them into one, and because of the way we've interpreted the plot, sometimes the, the yellow submarine serves as a form of the divine mind or even the, uh, the divine feminine. There's a, a goddess connotation to mm -hmm. how it acts on its own accord sometimes, particularly in the Sea of Monsters when they're challenged um, by these crazy creatures, um, even without them doing anything, the submarine comes to their aid. Uh, and then especially at the end of the Sea of Monsters, there's this very peculiar monster called the vacuum monster, and it sucks up every other monster in the sea, including the yellow submarine. I remember the first time I saw that, I was very concerned, because <laughs> where did it go? And then the, sub, the, the, the monster, in this wonderfully clever way that the animators came up with, it reaches over to the corner of the frame and sucks up the actual frame itself. So it's standing there in, in a white void, and then it notices its own twitching tail and reaches around and sucks itself up into a pop, into oblivion. And all of a sudden, there's nothing. So the submarine has been left in this void of nothing. Well, we don't know where it is because there's nothing. And then all of a sudden, the submarine pops out. So it's almost as if this divine mind, maybe goddess potential, protected our heroes from this being sucked up their own existence, I think is the way they say it, being sucked up their own existence, and they pop them out into the land of nowhere, where they meet the Nowhere Man, the song, the Nowhere Man gets sung, uh, whom they named the Boob, which, um, back to factual reality, was one of the very first characters created for the film and made it all the way through all the various script uh, renditions. Uh, they wanted to have a, a silly nowhere man creature that was who uh, a lot of people take credit for basing it on who it is based on, but uh, we won't get into that now. But well, the, in a uh, way, the nowhere man is the the nowhere man as a song was John Lennon's first attempt at at writing a song that wasn't specifically a love song. Uh, that was their first ah. hit. That was not really um, you know I want to hold your hand or do you love me and that kind of thing. It was you know, about being a nowhere man. So you get again again into that um, Buddhist concept of nowhere, no thing, nobody, uh, and they put a real emphasis on the harmony. He's a real nowhere man. So again, you've got that back and forth of real, no, you know, you join up the opposites of real and nowhere, and they emphasize nowhere, no thing. You know, get out of well, your uh, attachment to reality. In a way, that, that vacuum character is the portal to getting clarity on who we are and That's realizing that we are that, that we are a blank slate and therefore we can create who we are you know as much as we we want to um, put our put our energy into it you know we are a blank slate when we come into reality and and it's it's our environment that creates who we are and we get to a certain point in time where we can take over that creation and recreate parts of ourselves that we think need improvement right it's like a, a desert of nowhere where the the mind the yellow submarine it has sort of a mental breakdown the submarine actually breaks down at that point and we've been saying that there are there are four beetles and they've got one captain his name is old fred or young fred so we've got five heroes. They're standing for the five senses, and they meet this other character. So now they've acquired a sixth sense as, as, uh -huh. as their guide, this the boob. Um, so they've entered this nowhere state of consciousness, which lifts them up, as you're saying, out of their five physical senses so that they can operate on this higher mental plane. 
And what I find really interesting is that synchronistically, at the same time that the filmmakers were making up this idea, the real-life Beatles, who, remember, were not making this film. They were off doing their own thing. Um, they, they signed a contract to let the people make a film about them, and they said, yes, you can use our songs, and yes, we'll create four individual original songs for you to use, but otherwise we're going to keep it at arm's length until they realized that the artwork was really groovy and that they were going to make some uh, lasting impact by being preserved in animation. And they, they came around in the end, but while they were making it, they had nothing to do with it, really. So they're passing through their own desert, in a way, of nowhere land at the same time while this part of the film is being created because in August of 1967, when the film was just getting started, they lost their manager, their guide, their Brian Epstein when he had that sudden death. Um, they just lost their way for a while. They didn't quite know what to do with themselves. And then in February of the following year, in 1968, they left for India. They discovered the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi at this time and they started to deeply explore meditation. All four of them went off to India for those four months, and uh, they began to glimpse their inner peace in this desert of solitude, and that's when their creativity began to flow again, as, as famously uh, is known by the Beatleologist, that's where the White Album was born, and they, they wrote a lot of their, their best hits while in that deep state of meditation. So, well, the, the, you know, I... Go ahead. I, I have... Um, I talk to a lot of different people and a lot of different modalities, and one of the one of the um, best forms of meditation that that has come out of all of this is the no mind meditation, where you you literally focus on nothing and you don't allow anything to come into your mind, and by doing that, you open the portal to the higher consciousness, the spirit within, for inspiration to come through. Well, I think that what basically what we, when we all began to work in the meditation, that's one of the first things we we learned is to make it blank, uh -huh. which is not an easy thing to do. No. <laughs> Especially right. if you're a Virgo. You're always Mind there. is running. That's right. It's like a little puppy. That's what my <laughs> yoga teacher told me the other day. Said, Pretend your mind is like a little puppy and you always have to bring it back and sit it down. <laughs> yeah. well, but there are some but, other kind of mysteries involved here in regards to the Beatles and um, what the B-E-E-T-L-E-S. Ah, yes. What does it mean? And, and Egypt, mm -hmm. and Egyptian cosmologically, excuse me, mobs cosmology, the beetle is a sign of the creative force of rebirth. The four mob tops inadvertently chose a name for their band that connected them to the ancient Egyptian beetle headed god named Kepera, K-H-E-P-E-R-A, a god of creative magic and renewal. The scarab beetle amulets are all found all over Egypt, Egypt small, big, uh, and decorative. Uh, they are also buried with every Egyptian mummy, and that's one of the major reasons why they are, is because of the meaning of those stones themselves and the higher consciousness that's involved with them. And so by 1967, the four Beatles had certainly mastered rebirth, renewal, and starting out as high school skiffle band, then growing into a hard-rocking bar band in Hamburg, then into international pop stars, and finally transforming themselves as Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. That's quite an extraordinary that's a lot of Picture. renewal and rebirth. Yes. They really did change their their whole performance style, their look, everything, through many different types, you know, in the short time that they were together, 10 years. Um, another Beatle, um, Bob was mentioning from his, his earlier interpretations of the film, um, Kepera, the Beatle-headed sun god of ancient Egyptian mythology, flies through the air in a sunboat, so that's similar to the Beatles flying through the air in their yellow submarine. And in the film, the, the yellow submarine leaves Pepperland and flies to Liverpool to look for help once the Pepperland has been attacked by the Blue Meanies. So the old Fred character takes off at the top of a pyramid, another symbol that jumps right out to Dr. Bob doing his dissertation on the reverse of the Great Seal. Um, but the first person he meets in Liverpool is Ringo, who has, in real life, is, is a cancer. So his 
His sun sign is the symbol of the scarab beetle. Once again, there's another beetle for you, the creative force of rebirth. Um, he lands in, well, Liverpool is depicted at that time as the real world as opposed to the Pepperland, the utopian um, in the mind type of place. So the real world is, um, they, they illustrate it to the song of Eleanor Rigby, and it's clearly an industrialized wasteland, which is contrasting to show how alone we feel when we're disconnected from the source. And poor Ringo's wandering around by himself feeling, feeling very lonely. And each of the Beatles then passes through a little self-realization as they decide to go on this trip. And even young Fred changes to old Fred. And suddenly we've got five characters who are going to be our, our heroes. Um, that, that I mentioned before, that's the, the five senses that we relate that to. Uh, again, based on Bob's early interpretations of the film that he had to make up all by himself, based on he tried <laughs> to reach the Beatles and then ended up turning to transpersonal psychology uh, masters of Rollo May and Carl Jung and Abraham Maslow to understand how uh, there can be unconscious symbolism in creation of art and the meaning of and how you can get to those levels of interpretation without intention. Yeah, that's one of the major reasons why I had to uh, take five and a half, six years or so on working on my dissertation because it was all key to understanding this particular film. Uh, without that kind of information, I don't think I would have moved in this direction, um, even though I would have, I was, I suspected there were other things that were going on, but never found out about. And that, of course, when you when you listen to the creators, the, the, the actually, I, when I say creators, I'm actually talking about the guys that did the, the painting and the, and the drawing and all. When you when you look at them and you and you hear how they evolved through this particular process, you can see it's almost like they're. This was a the actual making of the film elevated their awareness they had to do to create it to move into a higher dimension, perhaps maybe the fourth or maybe even the fifth dimension in order to understand this. Uh, so this is, the whether the Beatles understood it or not, they have created something or are responsible for creating, let's put it that way, and they paid for it. They, they were the ones that, that uh, saw it through. Um, it's, a, it's a type of selflessness is what it represents to me, that, that they actually are laying down the foundation of the ageless wisdom teachings through certain symbols over a period of time. And um, I think that eventually when more people read that kind of philosophy, they almost immediately look towards breaking through separatism and you reuniting which is the key, I believe, of what uh, the Yellow Submarine is doing in reu reuniting the people. Remember, no one got killed during in this film. Uh, the, True. They, you know, the, that, and that really was important to, to understand uh, that no death was going to be the, the key to elev elevating consciousness, which I think is what we have obviously need to do with our country today, and with the planet as well, in an even a larger way. Right, they're transformed. Your enemies are transformed. Um, they do have a big battle, but nobody's hurt or killed. Um, and that's one of the things we love most about this movie, is the solution at the end is the, the enemies are transformed into their friends. And that's done, again, through the help of the Nowhere Man, who pulls out a a poem from his little spell book, and he transforms the chief Lumini, who's this utterly evil creature, into one bursting with life and joy and actually, literally, <laughs> pink roses and carnations just start popping off of him. And it's like he's awakening from a bad dream. He Suddenly he remembers he's related to the bluebird of happiness, and, and he, he's literally blooming with peace. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the birds and flowers start coming out of his head, and that's the, that's the climax of the film. Everybody starts grooving together. The meanies come back, and the, they dance with the Pepperlanders and the Beatles, and 
they, they this wonderfully transformative song, uh, It's All Too Much by George Harrison. Um, so it's the, the ultimate boon at the end of the Joseph Campbell mythology outline of the hero's journey is when they transform the meanies into friends. It's, it's the goal of the Yellow Submarine was not simply to rescue Pepperland, but transform what's a perceived enemy into peaceful co-inhabitants, peaceful, loving co-inhabitants. So the, the dark forces, the blue meanies in this case, they're not defeated by the light, which is love and music. That's what they use to conquer them. They're transformed by exposure to the light. So well, that's, that's well, a wonderful well, message that everybody can take off. While, while the, the movie is definitely symbolic of, of you know, humanity in our lives, it's also symbolic of a personal transformation where the blue meanings are self-doubts and negative concepts within ourselves. That's correct. So, so that you know, you have that duality going on here, where where our reality is certainly full of a lot of blue meanings these days. Um, mm -hmm. We also have self-doubts, and so you know, the the inner journey is just as, impar as important as the external journey of humanity. And perhaps <clears throat> maybe COVID-19 has something to do with this in regards to slowing people down and forcing them in a certain sense to start looking inside to find out that they have a whole other life and consciousness that they have uh, abandoned for maybe 20, 30, 40 years or more. Absolutely, and re yeah. And, re and rediscovering uh, your, your soul, uh, because that's the key to, in my opinion, everything from the standpoint of higher consciousness is where the entire planet is heading, not just us, and, and also as part as part of the, this part of our, the universe, in my opinion, as also that I, I may be speaking out of term here, but I, I've I done know. that a few times. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think... Certainly, I have looked upon the quarantine as an, a, a time out for humanity to re-examine themselves and their lives and, and where they want to take their so, themselves. And a lot of people's lives have changed in a very positive manner. I mean, yes, people have passed away. Yes, it's a horrible thing. But at the same time, you grow from it. And um, if you're still here on the planet, you must have stuff you have to do. Right, and hopefully people have taken it. A lot of people have taken advantage of the of the time to do self reflection and introspection and learn yoga, like I have, <laughs> or you know learn <laughs> meditation. Those are the types of things that we encourage and that we hope that people might take away from the film. With our help, the film Yellow Submarine. It's it's not just a, a fun cartoon, although it can be appreciated that way. Um, but it is full of monsters, as you were saying, and that's because Heinz Edelman, the designer of the film, really liked to draw monsters. And <laughs> at some point he got so fed up with the, the candy, flossy skips, scripts that were being given to him to, to do a quick slapdash cartoon that he just started to draw monsters. And then you've got this sequence in the film called The Sea of Monsters. It goes on for over six minutes, and there's not a Beatles song in it. So it's, it's pure download from Heinz Edelman's <coughs> subconscious um, but symbolically, monsters are perversions of truth or reality, as, as uh -huh. Hieronymus over there was um, already distinguishing back in the 60s. We, we create monsters even in our own auras every time we lie or distort the truth. So it's all, um, you know, there's, there's the warning at the end of the film. The John Lennon, real John Lennon comes on and says, uh, you know, we have to look out. There's newer and bluer meanies even within the vicinity of this theater. So we all, what, do we, what does he tell us to do? We have to go out singing. And what do we sing? We sing all together now. I love that song. Uh -huh. It's such a simple childlike song, but, you know, and it repeats itself over and over again. But it, the, the, simple me the simple message is all together now. It, it's another way of saying we're all one people on, on one planet. And I, I think in, in 1999 it was George Harrison, again, on the Beatles anthology, he said the same thing. We've got uh, blue meanies have got a bigger stranglehold on the planet now even than they had back in the 1960s, the, especially the music industry has turned gray and is dominated by blue meanies. So they're never going to go away. 
and we're always going to have to work with them. But the idea is not to kill them or suppress them, but to transform them by showing them the light. And one of the great ways of doing that is through Beatles music. It's just so attuned to peace and love. They were wonderful poets. They were absolutely fantastic at harmonizing. And it's got this catchy rhythm that you can dance to. And dancing is good for your brain. And it, it's something that everybody around the world responds to. When there's rhythm, people start to move. And that starts your brain thinking along what you're listening to. And if what you're listening to is all you need is love, love is all you need, or all together now, over and over again. Or even we all live in a yellow submarine. That itself is a, a wonderful way of looking at life. We're all in this together. We're all on one big planet. And each one of us has what we need already. We already have it. It's within us. There's, there's another element uh, to this film. And it deals with uh, Atlantis, because Pepperland is, by and large, a utopia. And because it is a utopia, and I think it's also referring to Atlantis, when we heard the narrator introduce the film as being set in a long-ago utopia, that obviously seemed to me that they were talking about Atlantis. Now, Atlantis has was much in the news in 1968 with the under water archaeological discovery called the Bimini Wall, or Bimini Road, confirming the Edgar Cayce predictions about where Atlantis would be discovered first. Folk singer Donna Donovan, yeah, who earlier had contributed a line to that song, Yellow Submarine, had a hit in 1968 called Atlantis. According to Plato and other ancient writers, Atlantis was a utopia under attack, and the survivors from the sinking continent landed in various parts of the world, and many believe such an advanced law civilization seeded the great civilizations of our ancient history with evolutionary knowledge that seems to have come out of nowhere, such as how to build pyramids. The pyramid now has become a very huge symbol in the world today. They are building them like crazy, especially in China. They have discovered something much more important about pyramids that happens out around them, not inside them, but outside of the pyramid. A certain kind of healing can take place. Well, I'm sorry, I, had, I wanted to make sure we, we touched on that aspect of it because it is a utopia, and I believe in utopias. I believe we can get there. And it's a state of mind as well. Pepperland is a state of mind. Utopia is a state of mind that we can all aspire to in, in a symbolic way, you know, Pepperland as the, as the utopia. Absolutely. And I think one of the other things that, that came out in the book were how, how all of the artists talked about how this experience changed their lives. No. And one of the one of the things that, that I have found is that when you become involved in a creative pro project, when you are definitely in the flow of that creation process, there is joy, there is love, there is compassion. It takes you to another state of consciousness. And with with the intensity of this whole project, they lived in that state of mind for, for I don't know how long and, and probably created a portal that they were able to go through to touch, to touch into other aspects of themselves that they might not have touched into had they not been forced into this kind of a, an experience. And the joy that is a part of the, the aspect of creation is probably one of the biggest highs you can ever have. And you were very explicit in saying that this was not a psychedelic experience as far as drugs go. I mean, at the most it was alcohol and maybe a little marijuana. Um, but, but for the most part, you get high on the joy of creation. Yes, you do, indeed. That, that's one of the great things about being in your studio, isn't it? I mean, when you're in your own studio, in an art studio, you, you are in control of all those things around you, and, and you grow with them. They become more magical over your decades of working in a single place. Of, of, Absolutely. Of that energy coming out. I mean, so, for, so when, you went, when you work for like 15 to 20 years in one space, um, you have, you have ma manipulated that space 
that that space is is uh, more part of you than anything else, and that's one of the reasons I, that uh, I think a lot of people want to become artists because the thrill of creating something that is uh, elevates you and other people is 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 so much gold from the standpoint oh, yeah. of cement bring, building well creating methods by which we can join one another without having to be demanding of each other. Oh, yeah. I did the Cosmic Deck of Initiation, which were, it's a deck of oracle cards that are hand-painted Mandela's. And for those nine months, I, I lived on probably three hours sleep a night, and I was never more vitalized in my life. I, yeah, I can, I believe that. It's, it's, it's a magical state of mind that you get in when you when you are focused and determined and and you know and, and it's a joyful one it's it's the kind of um and and the the artists that did this this the the animation and the drawing and the coloring and all of that you you get into that flow of energy and and you just don't want to leave it and it 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 impacts you to the point where you are you probably for the rest of your life, are searching for another way to get back into that kind of energy to, to be able to manifest something greater within your own life. Yes. yes. You know, we heard that again and again when we interviewed the people that are in Volume 2 especially, that it was the best year of their lives and it changed them forever and it impacted the way they thought about the world and, you know, started off several lifelong marriages. There is a, a wonderful anecdote going around there for years that it was um, there were a lot of babies that were produced during those 11 months. And, and that's true, but not as much as the storytellers would have us believe. In fact, we found, I think there were 10 uh, couples that either met on the submarine or just before or married during the submarine, and then they stayed married for 50 years. So these were lifelong love matches that yeah. were inspired by their work on the yellow submarine um but you're right it was it was a it was a perfect storm i think i said that before but it was organized chaos it was really a very chaotic way to make a film when you had the american producers breathing down their necks to produce something quick and cheap and the the british uh contingent plus all the artists that they hired from around the world pushing back and saying no we want to do just to our heroes and make something lasting um but there was this enough genius there in the creative team making the right decision. So the deadline pressure only helped fuel that because when the team is creative enough, genius can flow. Um, but it mm -hmm. comes down to chaos. It's the complexity of, of chaos theory and, and the choices that you make, that you pick out of these things that are flying around and that they just happen to be the right things that work. So it goes a long way to arriving at the, at the right result. Some would call it visual development, but you have all this stuff to choose from and that the choices that you make have a, a tremendous effect on the final result of, of any film, but it could oh, be a disaster yeah. if you didn't have the right type of, of positive energy flowing. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. And then well, a I... lot of them will talk about the role of the city itself, the swinging London itself. Heinz Edelman, when he read our first book, said... The, the one character that you left out that makes a big difference is Swinging London because it was such a weird place at the time. <laughs> um, we, he, he, ta he, caught, he talked about the unreality of every day because there's this certain sort of weirdness that was taken for granted, especially in Soho. That's the neighborhood where they, they were housed. Soho, if, if you don't know, is a, a very... Um, well, it's an unusual com combination of, of things going on there in this in this neighborhood. Um, a lot of art studios, a lot of animation studios. For some reason, that's where the animation studios, a lot of them were, film production, editing suites. But also, the pornography industry was housed down there. They had a lot of strip clubs, a lot of burlesque shows, and a lot of winos and weirdos and eccentrics were just drawn to this place. So that you'd have a lot of street performers. Um, in Volume 1, we talk about Heinz Edelman tells us the story of one of the times he went out to lunch with the Beatles. And as they're leaving, 
they're serenaded in the middle of the street by this old gentleman who had a water tap glued to his forehead, and he had roses behind his ears, and he's walking down the middle of the street singing When I'm 64, and he waves. The Beatles waved. They knew him, and all the people at the strip clubs waved. He was a familiar character at the time. We put some pictures that we, we were lucky to find some pictures of, of him. They called him Rosie. Um, and another one called the Earl of Mustard, who pushed along a baby pram and did tap dances. And um, there were Hare Krishnas walking through all the time. There was just all these eccentrics. And um, one of the lines from Paul McCartney's song, she said she'd always been a dancer, worked at 15 clubs a day. Well, he was also down there in Soho at the same time. They were producing Magical Mystery Tour at the same time they were doing Yellow Submarine around the corner. So this is the, the starry-eyed nature of the younger set of animators that are featured in this volume two. They were all big fans of the Beatles. Well, the older set that we interviewed in volume one, they were a bit more jaded. Some of them had been in World War II, fighter pilots, intelligence, and uh, this set, they'd been in, working in animation for 20-some years, cranking out commercials. That was where mostly animation was being used for producing TV commercials back in the 50s and the 60s. If you weren't working for Disney, producing feature-like films, you were cranking out commercials. That's how you made a living. Um, but anyway, uh, London was full of all this wonderful change. The, the Mary Quant fashions were coming in. There was psychedelic color flowing. Uh, every, everything was changing. The styles were changing. Design was changing. And these young people were just swept up into it. Music was changing and they had a chance to draw something that they really loved and produce uh, a lasting project for their, their heroes. Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the other things that, that hit me um, dead on was that when the Blue Meanies were, were bombarding Pepperland and, and everybody was going gray, and that when, when they got rid of the Blue Meanies, in, in other words, inside of inside of you, if you get rid of the doubts and, and the fears, it, you, your, your world goes from black and white to technicolor. Yeah, that's quite a, an important symbol there. Yeah. Yep. In the story, yes, that, that's true. Yep. When the submarine comes back um, with the Beatles in tow, well, not in tow actually, but anyway, when it comes back to rescue Pepperland, it comes down through the sky, the gray clouds turn to rainbow colors uh -huh. and the yellow comes back into a land that's been dominated by blue and you've got the combination again of colors you've got yellow with blue and that makes green and green is the color associated with pepperland it's got these green rolling hills the mayor the lord mayor's in in green robes and um, you could say that the two colors together uh, are in balance in green so we we talk about goethe's color theory and the wonderful uh, you can have all kinds of wonderful combinations of conversations about color and the many colors and the combinations of the colors. But in, in particular, the yellow coming back to blue and creating green. I was, I was noticing, you know, because I'm into the chakra stuff too, so that mm -hmm. the chakra colors are very, very apparent there. And, of course, the green is the heart chakra. And is so, heart. you know, it's, 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 it was amazing when you... When you, after you've enjoyed it a couple of times and you've sung your way through it, then you can watch it and look for the messages that are, that are there subliminally. And depending on where you are inside of yourself, you know, it, it'll determine just, you know, what messages come out that are most appropriate for you to see and remember and sort of link on to. So it takes you on an amazing trip within yourself as well. There you go. Yep, yellow, the yellow of the submarine, as Bob was saying, brings expansion in the mind back to the land uh -huh. that's dominated by the blue, which is the color of crystallization or contraction or emotions. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's great, the uh, green chakra of the heart. Well, and uh, the, other, the other thing that, that I loved was the, the, the holes, you know, where, where they were in and out of the holes. I mean... Don't we all go down wormholes from, or rabbit holes from time to time and come back out in another place and with greater awareness and understanding? Yeah, that, that's one of the wonderful things about growing and developing and seeing things, uh, out, especially outside of the usual. 
And, you know, one of the things that Laura and I talked a little bit about dealing, dealing with the divine feminine or the goddess principle, um, Lars, you want to touch on that? Because I do want to get to the point of the possibility of the yellow submarine itself may have been feminine or a part of the, of the female aspect, because the film is just uh, has so much uh, masculine energy. Uh, and, but the most important energy they have that protects them and uh, helps establish uh, other things well, there's almost no female characters in the film. So we, um, our last book was about the Statue of Liberty and the symbolism of liberty as a female, and we got really into the goddess principle and feminism. So we were looking for any kind of female message or, or tendency that we could find. Um, and when they're in a place called the foothills of the headlands, they, they, the submarine breaks down again through their seas of illusion that they're going... Um, and they end up in this place that's dominated by just heads. They have no bodies, so they're, they're minds without a heart. There's no connection to other beings in relationship. They're, they're like the nowhere man. They, uh, he asks for directions, and the arrows just go around in circles because the heads, they're just all thoughts. There's no connection to their heart. Um, but then they, one of them opens up, and there's this Lucy character. Uh, they start the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which is just this, beautiful, pure, surrealistic, delightfully, um, the, the, the one segment of the film that most people remember, uh, it just tickles your eyeballs, as one of the reviewers said. <laughs> um, so the Lucy in that, in that song is, is you could compare her to the eternal beloved of the troubadours. She's like a muse. Mm -hmm. But at the end, they have to shake free because they're in this reverie during that whole song, and they have to move on with their quest. That's another element out of the Joseph Campbell Framework. They have the they have the inspiration, but they can't stay there, or they would just be stuck in this surrealism. Um, but both Lennon and McCartney saw this Lucy that they wrote about Lucy in the Sky as a goddess of some kind. Um, Lennon was quoted as saying that she's this female who would come and save me, this secret love that was going to come to me one day. And McCartney called Lucy was God, the big figure, the white rabbit. So there's the one divine goddess principle. But then from there, they end up in the Sea of Holes, which is what you were talking about. Um, the Sea of Holes is this op art uh, manifesto, which is this, this big, uh, it's very um, disconcerting, especially if you have epilepsy or anything. Yeah. Um, it can really trigger you um, because it's, a, it's, a, it's very hard to see. It was very hard for them to film, too. There's this, black, this white background with this long dimensional black hole. Holes are everywhere. So it's, it's a place where being and non-being are reversible, as reversible as space and time in the other, in the other seas. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a typical threshold world, as, as Bob said in his earlier interpretations. It's the opening of one world to another, and they're, they're about to enter Pepperland, which is a state of mind. It's a peaceful state of mind, a utopia, but they have to pass through this dimensional shift first, and they have to do it, well, in the song, it tells you how do you get there. You get there through the Sea of Green. So they, they, they find the Sea of Green by landing on the one green hole in this entire universe, and that ends them, transforms them. All of a sudden they shift like they're going through a Star Trek transformer, and there they are. They've landed at the top of the pyramid launch pad in, in Pepperland, which reminds us of Noah's Ark and all the, the flood stories. They've, they've landed the Ark on top of a mountain shape, uh, or even the reverse of the Great Seal. Bob compares the landing of the yellow, bright mind sun on top of the female symbol of the mountain, the pyramid, to his dissertational work, which is on the reverse of the Great Seal. Maybe he can talk about that a bit. Oh, well, yeah. Espe oh, especially, could you repeat that question there? I'll well, comparing the <coughs> yellow submarine landing on the mountaintop pyramid launch pad to the symbol of the reverse of the Great Seal, which most people mm -hmm. are familiar with from the back of the $1 bill, where you have the eye in the triangle, of course, um, uh, over a pyramid. And uh, there is still some uh, discussion as to what kind of a pyramid it is. It was uh, always thought to be an Egyptian pyramid. Uh, there's other thoughts and 
about that now because they are discovering that there are hundreds of pyramids, and now there are uh, many hundreds being created, brand new ones, uh, especially in, in China. Uh, for some specific reason, uh, they feel that that what they've seen on on uh, Mars is going to be a type of life, a life source. And I think that, that um, I wish that um, um, NASA would, would be more open to us about it, but NASA never is. And But you have to go to almost other countries to find out what, what they are really finding on the moon at this time and on Mars, uh, especially with the moon. They have discovered that there's some kind of a... a, a uh, it's a kind of a powder that they have found on the moon that if you use, it can help grow food, which is going to change, as they say, if this is true, that it's going to be, they're not going, there's not going to be a problem out about needing food. There should be, there would be enough for everyone, which is quite extraordinary from what we were always thinking about what we had to take along with us to the moon or Mars and that kind of thing. So, but my interest in the pyramid and the eye in the triangle dealt with the spirit above, that is the eye in the triangle, and it's, it's uh, sitting above the, the physical world. It is uh, an interesting story of balance between that which is spirit and that which is physical. And I believe that is one of the key aspects in dealing with why the founding fathers of the United States decided that the pyramid and the eye and the triangle, even though many times people have said, hey, we, we should take that out. We should eliminate, the, eliminate those symbols. As a matter of fact, I had to oppose, uh, who was it? Oh, gosh, you're Rudy. Oh, um, my wife's favorite friend, and psychic, who predicted that, uh, um, who was going to be assassinated then, Kennedy was going to be assassinated. Uh, James, okay, uh, you're oh, looking for the um, name of Gene Dixon. Gene Dixon. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yes, Gene Dixon. Um, I, this is, I felt so uncomfortable about this to, to finally be introduced to, to Gene Dixon and then find out that, that I had to, had to question her on, on some of the things she had to say. She was interpreting the reverse of the great skill quite differently then? Yes, she was. Okay. She was, and she was... To giving a negative aspect of it. Oh, she got into, well, the, the popular culture will tell you that that's a Masonic or a Satanic symbol, which is not. a complete yeah. historical misnomer. Uh, but it looks like and it sounds like, so they go with it, and that's, that's, a, that's the kernel of a lot of conspiracy theories. Um, but the Founding Fathers did not, obviously, see that symbol as Satanic. or It, it wasn't even Masonic at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me, the Masons adopted it after it became a patriotic symbol, and because it was a patriotic symbol, it's, um, the radiant eye in the triangle in particular is seen in Christian churches throughout history. It's the symbol of God, or the all-seeing, omnipotent uh, force, which is what the deists, our founding fathers, were not necessarily Christians as we know them today, but they were deists, and they saw that as the, the uh, ultimate all-seeing, uh, what they call it, the omnipotent something or other, <clears throat> power of the universe and the unfinished pyramid it's important that it's unfinished it has no capstone is the symbol of the material world or the man or the matter and uh, it's not complete until you have that radiant eye or the the god part of yourself you know the little tiny spark of divinity that we all have within us comes down and attaches to it so when you see that happening in the film you've got that radiant yellow being traveling through the, the you know this godlike being traveling through the, the ether, coming back down to land on a, an unfinished mountaintop or bandstand or, or pyramid, whatever you want to call it, uh, there you have the same message as the Founding Fathers were trying to teach us when they put it on our great seal. They thought it was so important they put it on our great seal, you know, the, the side that people see on, that's been, been adapted to the presidential seal with the eagle and the holding the arrows and the olive branch in one talon and the other is the very masculine side of the seal. But the other side they felt was just as equally important was the other side, the spiritual destiny of our nation, was to create balance between male and female, upper and lower, 
you know, the whole bit. So they were uh, very in tune with this being an experiment, the American experiment, and they really wanted to bless it for the future with the with the with the longevity of the pyramids and the, the overseeing uh, promise of their their of the God figure. Good going. Well, I, <clears throat> I'm really glad that they they brought that that aspect through, and that that has stood the test of time instead of Benjamin Franklin wanting the, our national bird to be the turkey. Yeah, much smarter bird, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, but can't you know, fly. you had to be you had to be careful with Ben Franklin because he he uh that little tongue in cheek all trickster, the time yeah. is a trickster. Um and that's one of the reasons why I admire him so much because he knew so much. He was a very oh, yeah. advanced soul. A very advanced soul and uh, one of the reasons why I do not do any more uh, television shows with uh, seven or eight different groups, um, all intelligent and everything, but is is that it really, it really, um, <clears throat> you can't always say what you really need to say to tell the truth on television. It's That's a very, true. It, you've. You've got to worm yourself around it, and I've gotten to the point where I just don't want to do History Channel or any of the other channels anymore because they have a reason, a purpose for why they're doing this, which I don't necessarily agree with. Uh, uh -huh. And, and a, a, a very materialistic interpretation of things rather than getting into the higher consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why I don't do their shows yeah. anymore. But... They still keep running them for some reason, especially around uh, the, what is it? Uh, well, the patriotic holidays. You'll yes. often see a show that Bob did 20 years ago. And people 30 will years contact ago, him yes. And say, I saw you on TV. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, yeah, those um, cable channels especially are mostly interested in the sensational aspect, yeah. and uh, they'll tell you what they want you to say. And no matter what you <laughs> tell them, that's not the part that they'll use. Um, Bob would always want to try to talk about the, the Native American influences, which is extremely important. We would never have had our Constitution if we hadn't learned what we did, Ben Franklin and George Washington in particular, from the Native American system of government, which was already in place for hundreds of years before the Europeans oh, yeah. landed here. Uh, but they don't want to talk about that. It's not sexy and it's not controversial enough, and they just want to talk about Ben Franklin visiting the Hellfire Club and the many prostitutes he may have had encounters with when he was in France and uh, you know, that kind of thing is, is not helpful to the message of the symbolism and what they were trying to do with the, the lasting impact. Symbols are very powerful. You know, one of the reasons we have such a disintegrated society these days is because we've lost the myths that used to hold us together. Uh, the ancient storytellers that you brought up at the beginning of your show, the, the indigenous people really value the storyteller and the myth. It, it sort of helps our brains make organization and, and meaning out of life. And when you disavow that as just story or as just a myth, you know, and sort of sweep it aside as something in a children's book, instead of telling them over and over again around the campfire to sort out your own reality, then you start to devolve into chaos and, and your brain can't make sense of things. That's, that's one of the, what, what uh, Rollo May said was the reason psychoanalysis developed in the first place was the, the cry for myth. You know the meaning, the higher the the higher meaning of of story, uh, and I think that Yellow Submarine fills that void, and that's one of the reasons. At 50 years old, it's a cartoon movie that we're still talking about it, and people still love it. And oh yeah. Watch it. And, well, I love the know. the the part where it went through. It looked like a grid, and they said they were going through the mind or the intellect, and you know the intellect is is compartmentalized. It is it is sharp. It is. Um, there's not a flow to the intellect unless you combine it with the spiritual, which became the portals and the holes. If, and you put the two together and you have a cohesiveness that, that enables you to get to places you couldn't get to by, by relying on one or the other. Right. That, that scene's called the Sea of Science, and they do that to the tune Science, of Only yeah. a Northern Song. And again, I have to give credit to the animators who... Charlie Jenkins is the one who came up with that, that idea. They, at the beginning of the production, had no script, remember? So they just started animating the songs, the songs that had been approved long ago. 
and uh, they really didn't know what they were doing. So that one in particular, you can tell it, that could have gone anywhere in the film. It, it you know it doesn't really mean a whole lot, but they they use the concept of vibration. You can see the audio mm-hmm. waveform of the song as it goes. You can it bounces around, um, and in this scene, space is being examined in a shifting way. The same way the scene before was all about time. They were in the sea of uh-huh. time, and they shuttled back and forth between time. And now all of a sudden we're, expe- we're examining space. And you go back to that old axiom of everything is vibration. Physical matter is constantly shifting in shape. And they, they emphasize that by using that waveform dancing. Um, and then what I think is really one of the, the, the charming scenes of the film, there's a monster that gets on board accidentally when they all get back in the submarine. Um, <laughs> yeah. The next scene is the sea of monsters, and the, a, a monster sort of slips in by accident. And he's really kind of cute. He's this little, uh, well, he's not little, but he's a purple elephant, dinosaur, bunny rabbit, mix, mix, mix mash. Heinz Edelman had a wonderful way of combining real things with um, animated, uh, with uh, anthropomorphized figures. So you've got teacups running around with legs on them and, and uh, a cigar lighting <laughs> monster. And in this case, it's just a mishmash of different monsters. And all the Beatles start making fun of it, and, and he cries, and it's, everybody feels sorry for it. But the Beatles seem unaffected by, by being so cruel. It's sort of like they're in their old personalities from A Hard Day's Night. They're doing that typical Beatles banter, poking fun at each other. And they're exhibiting their more self-centered state, and they have room for growth. So that's clear. And Ringo, again, uh, over and over in the film, is the catalyst for change. He's the one that pushes the button that lets the monster go back to where he belongs. Um, and he, it's another button that he pushes earlier when he gets um, somebody pushes a button to start the sub and somebody pushes a button that accidentally ejects Ringo. Yeah, he says, don't push that button, but he pushes it and he gets ejected himself into the sea of monsters. <laughs> he, well, we do tell that you. to ourselves. We, we, yep. we, we know where our buttons are and we still allow people to push them. And, you know, rather than, you know, disconnecting them or, you know, changing them to a different frequency, you know, with those, those buttons that are being pushed in our lives um, are, are really important for us to recognize. And, you know, it's sort of like, oh, my goodness, my button just got pushed and I have overreacted and I have to, I have to do some internal work here because that, it's no fun to overreact. And... So it's it's the button thing really got to me. I, I really that that to me was so symbolic of so much that goes on in our lives today. That that um, you know don't push that button. Don't do that. This button, boing. You know. You mean this button, right? That yeah. is very insightful. I'm very impressed. We learned something with this interview. With this, it seems like every time we get interviewed, somebody else brings up a new insight we hadn't thought of. Ringo Starr would tell you for years, children would follow him around and say, why would you push the button? Why did you well, push you know, the button? <laughs> but, you know, I think it's important for us to recognize we have buttons. And Exactly. So many of us don't. And, and I, I can remember working with a lady a long time ago, and I said to her, look for antique buttons. They're... You know, they may they have something to do with your life. You know, check them out, go to tag sales, whatever. A couple months later, she said to me, you know, I've looked at antique buttons, and they just don't do a thing for me. Huh. And and so I, I said to her, well, wait a minute, that that was so profound. I and then I then I realized that my interpretation had been wrong. And I said, is there somebody older who's pushing your buttons? And she said, oh my God, yes. Oh. And so the element of buttons being pushed really rang true to me because yeah. every now and then something happens in one's life where you, you know a button is going to be pushed and, and it's so simple to go back in and rewire yourself to understand mm-hmm. that there's a better reaction, there's a better way of dealing with this. And, you know, and we have buttons because we need because there are lessons we need to learn. And, you know, better a button being pushed than, you know, something being dropped on our head. So, you know, deal with the buttons before they become big monsters. Right, 
or as you say, I like that concept of rewiring your button so that when you push it or someone else pushes it for you, it doesn't eject you into the sea of monsters, but yeah, whatever, swivels your chair around or does something instead, whatever you want it to do. And you can do that Absolutely. through your own conscious, exactly, your own conscious intention and meditation and use your card set, as you say. Yeah, There's, and... Uh, oh, okay. oh, I can talk? <laughs> sure. Okay. I just wanted to note that uh, there is, Laura, uh, there is one area that we would never have covered if you had not gotten involved with this book. And uh, this is something that really impressed me about uh, Laura's work. It deals with joins the peace movement. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to uh -huh. us about that? Because this is a whole section that she worked on for quite some time, and it uh, is extraordinary. Well, we do get teased sometimes for taking this film too seriously <laughs> and interpreting a lot into it. But as we discovered, we're not the only ones, and we heard from fans around the world who have interpreted it even on more deeper levels than we have bringing quantum theory into play that is beyond my understanding. But uh, in doing the digging and the research to, to follow up on these, I, I stumbled upon um, the Yellow Submarine truly influenced the peace movement. This is the anti-Vietnam War peace movement of the late 60s. And it's mostly the song, more so than the film, that had the impact. It was as soon as it came out. It was the, it was the first Beatles song that wasn't specifically a love song. Um, it came out before Nowhere Man. Um, and people set to interpreting it. They were trying to figure out, okay, what is this about? It's got to be about something. It can't just be a submarine. It can't be as simple as all that. A lot of people saw it as a drug message. There was a, a popular drug at the time that was a yellow capsule, Nembutal. And uh, there's this big theory then that the Beatles did that on purpose to encourage you to take drugs. And therefore, you know, you take a trip on the old submarine, you end up in Pepperland, and everything is groovy. Um, and that translated into the film, as you alluded to earlier, that the film was all a message created by people who were hallucinating on drugs to encourage you to do the same, which couldn't be further from the truth, because as the animators would tell you, you can't possibly hold your pen steady if you're <laughs> on drugs, for one True. thing. But, you know, you just can't keep a clear mind. It's a really hard, exacting job animating. You have to be within the lines, you know, and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, they took extended lunches at the local pub, the Dog and Duck. They had a long, a lot of meetings down there, um, you know, three-hour lunches, and sometimes brought some bottles of wine back with them. And they tell this wonderful story about a, a tequila-fueled Mexican hat dance one rainy afternoon that spilled out <laughs> into the, the film studio. But other than that, you know, there was no, no great drug message. But um, the peace movement was influenced almost immediately. This film, the, the song came out in, like, August or so, but by October they were already singing it. The, the peace movement was, was shifting at the time from um, the summer of 68 was pretty violent, um, and then the, after the film came out, they, they were starting to bring more street theater in, uh, being more, they, they wanted to control the message. The media was, was uh, describing the activists in one way, and they wanted to change the way that they were being depicted, so they, they started to create floats of yellow submarines, you know, six, eight-foot-long submarines. This was before the film came out, I should say. So they didn't have a basic, a basis for design. They were all over the place with their designs, filling them up with bread and peace symbols and launching them into the harbor. Um, they would sing them at the, as the armed forces went by. They would sing yellow submarine to them. They, um, they built one for the March on the Pentagon, which is where they were uh, the activists were uh, uh, faced with fixed bayonets, and they would go through and put the flowers in the rifle barrels while they sang "Yellow Submarine." So it was a it was a wonderful way of bringing them together. And uh, we found one one interview on TV where the students were talking about it. The students at Berkeley, when they spontaneously broke out singing "Yellow Submarine," when they were protesting the the uh, ROTC on campus, but then the next day they, they quickly printed these flyers that had uh, an abstract yellow submarine on it, and they said, we adopt for today this unexpected symbol of the yellow submarine of our trust in our future and our longing for a place to sit for all of us to live in, and we take this music seriously. It's an understanding that we're banding together in a yellow submarine, and it represents a new way of looking at life. 
Um, so they, 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 they got it. And then it went to church. The, the peace yeah. movement um, infiltrated the church movement. So a lot of young activists, uh, again, from Berkeley in particular, were, uh, were from the religious movement. They were already priests, and they wanted to revise the church so that it would return more to Jesus' message of, of uh, helping the poor. So they did a lot of direct action to, um, they opened up drug centers for the kids and for runaways and for draft dodgers. And um, they started calling themselves submarine churches and then later on yellow submarine churches. And they, they did protests against the, the, the concaves of the churches when they were having their annual conventions. They would unfurl these large yellow submarine banners and, you know, say we need to be more active in helping the poor and the, the downtrodden. And for a while they did. There was this yellow submarine church movement of about 100 churches with funny names like Alice's Restaurant. And uh, they would serve <laughs> beer and pretzels. They were trying to attract a younger crowd. for That was their communion. Uh, they would put on these wonderful displays, tableaus out of the, out of the Bible just so they'd have a, a, a reason to, to do theater and street theater. Um, and did some really wonderful work of counseling and, and sheltering and... Um, it eventually died out because, as most things do, they get infiltrated by the, the those in control and they co-opt the message. But for a number of years, the Yellow Submarine Church movement, and that's something that I'd never heard of and many people on the film had never heard of that we pulled out and, and wrote about in this book. Well, congratulations on that. I thought that, that was a, an extraordinary yeah. uh, area to go into, uh, which um, I had not even considered before because I was much more interested in what the Beatles were trying to do rather than what was really going on from that standpoint. But you know well, what I'd impact. like to talk about? Go ahead, Barb. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, no. Oh, it's, you know, I was going to change the go. subject if you had a follow-up. Well, I think, I just wanna, I, I think what, we, what we need today is another yellow submarine movement because I, I feel that, that society as a whole is ripe for it. And, you know, I'd love to see this put on television again or put in movie theaters again or publicized again because you have another generation here and they don't have any idea as to what peace, love, and harmony is all about. Mm -hmm. and, That's right. And, and well, I would love to see the society of today um, reminded those of us who are old enough to remember back then um, reminding us of, of what it's all about and educating a younger generation as to stop being a blue meanie and start being, you know, a flower person again. Yes, I, I think that that is something <clears throat> that in time we can work through uh, to do. Of course, you might have some opposition by the Beatles on that. I don't well, know. They did a wonderful job in 2018. 2018 was the 50th anniversary of the Yellow Submarine film. Yeah. And they did uh, another release, another theater showing, so it was shown in theaters again. And one of the best parts of that campaign was they did sing-alongs for families where they had the bouncing ball and the lyrics printed at the bottom. So um, just like you were telling us earlier that you were doing a sing-along with your cat <laughs> at home, but yeah. you could have done that. It's a much different experience when you're singing with a group of people in a theater, Absolutely. especially young kids. And, uh, you know, because you, you're you in train. You end up in training. Your brain waves and your heart waves all start going at the same rate when you're singing, especially with those beautiful harmonies. And that's what I wanted to talk about, that music is magic, and that is in the plot of the film. It's, but the, the healing power of music, which is something that goes back through time, you can read it about it in the Hebrew Bible and in the Greek myths of Orpheus and Apollo, um, and, and healers have used ecstatic dance for many years for treatment of depression, and today they know about it because music actually changes your brain waves. It lowers your stress hormones, it increases the feel-good chemicals like serotonin, so your immune system is boosted, your heart rates and your blood pressure, they go down, so there's this healing power of music, but... What's key in this plot, such as it is, you know, again, they didn't do this on purpose. It just fell together. At the beginning of the film, Pepperland already has music going. There's a Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is playing at the bandstand, and that's not enough to protect them because here come the Blue Meanies and they, they attack Pepperland. 
what's crucial to the Beatles' success when they come back and they bring their music. That's what wakens them all up is their music, but it's their particular type of music. It's got that love magic in it. It's got this catchy rhythms, the beautiful harmonies, and sometimes truly deep and insightful poetry. That's what some of their lyrics are really deep, you know. Love is all and love is everyone. That's the lyric from an earlier song before All You Need Is Love came out. It's quoting almost directly from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. He was, uh, John Lennon was reading the, psych the, the Psychedelic Experience, which is a book by Albert Leary and Metzner, which was based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It was written as a, as a means to guide, uh, guide the readers through their altered states of consciousness. And consciousness. People were experimenting with LSD and, and psychedelics, and they wanted to help people find a meaningful experience out of that um, experimentation. So when they sing All You Need Is Love, their mouths in the film are manifesting the words. The words are flowing out of their mouths, and they, they create a net, and the net ensnares the, the major villain, which is a flying glove. And then all the Pepperlanders, the people that were being suppressed by the Blue Meanies, they start lifting up the words of the song. So somebody's holding all, and somebody else is holding you, and someone else's need is love. And so they're fully embracing the actual meaning meaning of the words, and that's what creates the, the retreat of the Blue Meanies start mm -hmm. to fly up across the hill, um, into the hills. So you've got the power of love and music together makes the magic, and that's what it, that's their, their weapon, if you can call it a weapon, is uh, this love magic. And that's the same thing that the boob, the nowhere man, uses the final two who are left is the chief Blue Meanie and his sidekick. And uh, he uses that particular love magic to transform him, which I already spoke about, which is uh -huh. the end of the of the of the movie. Well, I think also the 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 blue glove is a clenched fist, mm -hmm. and the clenched fist was not able to destroy what love can create. Right, which it pounces, you know, and pounces and yeah. Yep. And and it doesn't work. So I I loved the the I mean I, I loved the representation of the pointing finger, which is kind of like you know authoritative and and clenched. And the, you know even when it became a fist and it was trying to squish out all of the good stuff, it didn't work. Right. So you know it 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 again is another symbol of how love love can you know conquer. Everything, and often not in the say, way you would. And that's why Go they ahead. say all you need is love. That's all you need. Right. And bringing people it, together. From that standpoint, it happens automatically. Love does that and uh, elevates our awareness so that we can operate on not just one but, but other levels of awareness at the same time, which we all try to do when we go through the process of prayer and meditation and uh -huh. the desire to serve and, and help others, because that's really the key. It would be really nice if there were groups that would just work with, especially uh, the elderly at this particular time, because there's a lot of great hope that can help, especially can come from the elderly, because of there's a lot of wisdom there that's not being used or seen or even expected, and yet it is there, it's always there. Uh, and I think that that's something that would alter where our country stands today. I think we got the right president for it, but I don't know how long it's going to take. Well, it's, well it, it is, it's definitely a journey. And I think one of the things, too, that, 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 that came out to me was that, that, you know, you have to love yourself first. Yeah. And w once you love yourself first, then... Then the roses bloom. <laughs> That's true. Yep. And what the Beatles were so good at was stripping it down to the bare essential. All you need is love. That says so much in just a few words. And at the end of the song, at the end of the movie, they're singing, It's All Too Much. And one of the lines from that is, Show me that I'm everywhere and get me home for tea. It's sort of like it's right out of the towel. The more you learn, the less you know. But it's oh, the, yeah. the peace, 
the peace that passes understanding, the thing that we're trying to reach, it's impossible for the, the, the rational mind to grasp. You know, the more you learn, the less you know. You have to be like a child. You know, get me home for uh-huh. me. You need to be simple and trusting and completely open to that life as love. But, you know, I, I just talked and talked and talked, and when all you really need to say is love is all you need, all you need is love. That's true, and so many people don't understand how to put that into action. Mm. And I think the movie does show how you can put it into action. And, and I love the, the, the nowhere man, you know, seeking the rungs on the ladder. That was, that was yeah. so profound. <laughs> yes, it was. Yes. <laughs> that was added by one of the animators. That's another yeah. thing that I like to talk about in terms of giving credit to these uncredited people. I think that was Arthur Humberstone. Uh, yeah. They had a lot of freedom to add in little things that they thought would be cute, and he added the foot uh, searching for the rung of the ladder. Uh, when the Pepperlanders are being reanimated, when the Beatles come back and bring them back to life, there's a, a pan across them, and one of them has a necktie on with a lady on it, and you see the, the uh-huh. lady in the necktie also coming back to life. She does a little boom, boom with her hips. That was Norm Drew's idea. He was an animator from Toronto, and he asked permission of the, the directors, can I just make this go here, too? And uh, in the in the sea of time, when you have all the psychedelic fish floating by, one of them has arms all of a sudden doing the breaststroke. That was the idea yeah. of Tom Halley, another animator who was, uh, his, he said the uh, the instruction was just to do flickering fish, but he said, can I add some breaststroke here? And he said, yeah, sure, go ahead. So uh, it was a collaborative effort of all these different people coming up with their own ideas mm-hmm. based on what, you know, they didn't know exactly what they were doing. They were just told to do this certain thing, how it worked in. They w- they'll tell you when they go to the rushes, you know, the, the, you can go see the film as it exists up to that point. You know, so you uh-huh. have the completely finished Eleanor Rigby, which was one of the first things finished. And then you'll go into some black and white line drawings, and all of a sudden it'll burst into color. Another scene will be partially done. And then you get a, a screen that says, scene to come. You know, there's this blank space. And they'll tell you that was the most exciting part because they didn't know what to expect yet. But um, Norm Drew tells us that when he, he first started, he came onto the project a bit late in, in January, um, and they was taken right away to see Eleanor Rigby. And he, he came back and he said, wow, 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 this is just so amazing. I've never <laughs> seen anything like it. And uh, he was so excited, and, and one of the directors walked past and said, what is it now? <laughs> he couldn't understand what Norm was saying. And Norm told him, no, I just saw Eleanor Rigby, and I'm just so excited. This is going to be the most mind-bending, you know, most uh, groundbreaking film ever. And the director was so happy. He said, look at this enthusiasm over here, folks. This is what we're all striving for. Well, so it's, it's you know, stories I... like these, these, these poor people who never didn't even get their name on the credits. You know, that's a, that was a, a story of, of conflict between the producers and the artists. They, a lot of the people didn't get even a name on the screen credits. Uh, so we like to tell their stories in our book. That's one of the reasons we, we wrote them, was to let them have their, have their history get told. Well, you did a great job, and, and I think it, it gives somebody a greater insight into um, the kind of people that went into the creation of this amazing project, and it's sort of reminiscent of, you know, decades and decades and decades later, um, Abba's Mamma Mia created one, I think, of the happiest movies I've ever seen, which is Mamma Mia. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the story was woven around their songs that had nothing to do with, I mean, the, the story was created because of the songs as opposed to the other way around. And that's, that's what happened here, but in a, in a similar but different fashion. And, yeah, less organized, and I think, no like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I love the fact that because you were turning artists loose to just be artists, they didn't have an agenda that they had to fulfill so that they allowed their intuition and their inspiration to create a message that that is subliminally there if somebody has the openness to look for it and feel it. And and quite often you feel there's something there before you realize exactly what it is. And I think that's part of the wisdom of TVC, the company that put this together, and the various people at the very top 
that know what the creative feeling is, so you don't get in the way of something that's good, so you don't get in the way of, of having a bigger ego, like as Laura suggested, the, the painting on the tie and the, and, and the adding little this is and that. We're all accepted because the people involved at the very top knew how to do this and how to treat people. That was one of the greatest things about John. John is, uh, that's what's his last name? You mean John Coates? Yes, the, John the Coates. Yes, the producer. Um, he, he made it possible for the artists to enjoy themselves as they were working and not to be fearful. But at the same time, uh, the, the artists had to be very careful about um, the other people from King Features because the King people from King Features is what the Beatles were against. They did not like what happened with the uh, first round of, of uh, pieces that were done, and they certainly wanted the great changes to come. But how do you do that unless you can, can work with one another? And that giving away, uh, say, for instance, allowing people to work on a tie made very big difference in regards to other people as they were seeing it and realizing that they had a real part. It was their idea to do those things, and they were allowed to. That's not the way it usually goes mm -hmm. in, 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 the, in situations like this. You are told what to do, and you better damn well do it. If you don't, you're out the, out the door, and that means you're in real trouble. So uh, you seldom see that kind of thing. Well, again, John Coates right person for the right job. He was the head of TVC in London, um, the, the company that had produced the cartoon Beatles, and he was just the right kind of temperament. He took all the heat from the American production company, King Features, so that the artists below him, the ones that are the younger set, they had no idea until the, the funds ran out. The funds ran out, and uh, there was a, a almost a strike and there was a kidnapping. It's all very dramatic. It, there could be a movie about the making of the movie because of the shenanigans they went through. But John Coates was such a, an English gentleman and a squire that he, he was able to handle all the hard part of negotiating with the, the people who wanted him to hurry up and do it for less and still allow the artists the freedom that they had to, to feel like they could contribute. Um, one of the reasons the film feels trippy, as some people will say, or they assume that it's a, a psychedelic experience, is because the designer, Heinz Edelman, deliberately inserted what he estimated was about 10% more design and more color than he normally would put in it, certainly more than your, your conscious eye can, can grasp at the, at the rate that the frames are going past, and that's the reason you keep getting more out of it each time you watch it. There are a lot of the witty puns will go right over your head until you hear it a second time, but again, if you put it in stop frame and watch a frame by frame, you'll see things that you never noticed before because they go by so fast. Um, so that's one of the reasons that it feels trippy, as, as people will say, because there's a lot going on that you're not consciously even aware of. Well, that's the joy of, of seeing it over and over again. I mean, when you, when, you, when you do an exercise like this, it changes the way you look at every uh, movie. In the in that you're you're looking for those messages, you're looking for those symbols. You're and and in probably seventy five percent of the movies out there, you can spot the symbols that are there, and and, and oftentimes not intentionally. They're just they're there because there's another level of consciousness working on the people that are actually doing the job, and that there is always a message of some sort there if you look for it. That's true. That's true. Yeah, and, and we'll it, make it, it if we don't. If it's not meant to be there, we'll make it. Oh yeah, your your brain and, and your brain makes connections, and we're so hungry for meaning. You know, that's one of the reasons the Beatles have been deified, so to speak, because they they we needed that. They they sort of a a convenient stand-in for an inner divinity. Uh -huh. We we all have it. Um, but they represent that simplicity and that, that purity. They have that positive affirmation of their, of their message. It, it lends itself easily to a, a doctrine of truth. And, and to, of course, there's that beat you can dance for, but there are people <laughs> yeah. who've, who've, um, who've 
called them avatars, you know, that they were sent by a higher source to influence the world. And, and I, can, I can buy into that. They, they, you know, on their first American tour, did you know that there, there were caretakers of handicapped children who would push through trying to get them to touch, very much like, like they thought they could be healed if they had to uh, uh, get, get close enough to them. Um, Timothy Leary famously wrote a, an essay called Thank God for the Beatles, and he called them evolutionary agents sent by God, and they were endowed with this mysterious power to create a new human species. But that's the way that a lot of people saw them. That's certainly not the way they saw themselves. They would they talk about um, you know participating in the big con. They're just throwing words together and throwing music together until they started to think about it. Well, you know, maybe there was something. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but don't you, so, don't they, you again, think... they were going so fast too. A lot of the, at the very but... beginning, they, they once they started going, they were going so fast. They were churning out hits one after another. That's but don't you think that all? Me. But all of us are avatars of a sort. I mean, exactly. you know, we are. That's my point. That's our you job. Know, we're spirits. Yeah, you know, we're spirits in the human body, and 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 i think everyone is is here to leave a message of some sort all of it positive yeah. it's just a matter of you know who we influence or how we influence and but the beatles i mean they i i love the fact that they 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 to this day will say you know we just we're throwing the words together it was not a big deal and the big deal is that they didn't take it as a big deal and get off on their egos yeah. They did their they did their thing and left the message to speak for itself and it does after all these years it still speaks. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and that's why we're talking about it fifty years later. It's it's you know the human spirit is longing for this day when we can and we we should behave as one people on one planet where love is all you need, and that's well it is, it is yeah it is called the family of man after all. Yeah, uh, the family of humans, all yeah. together now. Well, Every <laughs> one of us has all we need. I mean, I, I keep yeah. going back to that because they are so true. They're just little nuggets of truth and wisdom. Every one of us has all we need, and all our friends are all aboard. Absolutely. And, it, it you know, I wish I, I wish I could play a clip from it, but, you know... <clears throat> There are powers that be that, you know, have yeah. copyright things. and <laughs> But our listeners and, know how to do that. Just oh, absolutely. When, when they finish listening, they can flip over and listen to all the Beatles they want, and they'll hear it in a whole new way now. Oh, absolutely. I just noticed that, that we are out of time, and oh, I want to yes. thank Yeah, went by fast, didn't it? <laughs> yes, it did. Oh, we should mention yellowsubmarinebook.com. That's where you can buy the book. It is self-published. Yep. It is on Amazon now, but the cheaper way and autograph, and we can send bonus prizes. If you mention them, mention this show that you heard about on our show, we'll give you a bonus prize. We've got all kinds of wonderful toys and, and uh, collectibles of Beatles things, yellowsubmarinebook.com. Well, and, and let's not forget also your 21st Century Radio program, too. Mm-hmm. Yep, we're going for um, over 30 years now, the weekly interview show with uh, a lot of the same guests that you cover on your great show, uh, exploring consciousness <laughs> and ancient histories and mysteries of the universe and unexplained paranormal things, uh, as well as cultural heroes. We do a lot about Negro Leagues baseball and other another area of Bob's writing and justice. Uh, uh -huh. Music, you know, of course, the Beatles and the Yellow Submarine. Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix. Anybody who uh, strikes a chord and makes us want to be a better human. And yeah, happily, 21st Century Radio. That's the name of that website. Happily, there there are tons of people out there that that you know are available to spread the word. But I want to thank you so much for I you know we had to cancel and then we had to reschedule and I'm I'm glad we did because I got a chance to read the book again and certainly watch the video again, which I will do some more of too. Thank you. You've been so, so gracious. You thank, certainly thank have. Thank you for, for sticking by us to, to, to make this interview happen. Thank you. Oh. And there's an awful bad. lot of there's an awful lot of things that obviously we feel exactly the same as you do. Not that you're supposed to. It's just that the Ageless Wisdom teachings are kind of pretty much upfront. Age yeah, and they're ageless. That's cool. And that's right. They <laughs> they don't 
they don't fall apart and they're not, you know, from the standpoint that you can't do them anymore and you shouldn't, that kind of thing. So we got to cover more information on this show uh, than perhaps four or five other shows that we've done. All well, I'm time. so glad. So it, am I. It, it was such fun. Thank you so much for being here. And I'll, I'll talk to you guys again, I'm sure. Yep. All together now. And we're going to send you some prizes. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> thank yes, you, you so are. much. <laughs> okay, dear. Okay, everybody, thank you for joining us. Uh, don't forget, Tuesday is Mark's show, Mary, Mary uh, Joyce is Wednesday, and then there's a Solaris on Thursday. So keep up with me. It's going to be a nice week. Take care now.